Chapter 4.4, Part 3, Astronomy and Space Exploration and Art. So remember again that um, the night sky was really important to all cultures uh, until really, I would even say, the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century because that is something that um, many people spent a lot of time looking at. There was no other entertainment in the evening, maybe a little bit of dancing or singing or something like that. But mostly, they would have the night sky to observe, you know, usually in the warmer months. But um, many hours are spent outside phases of the moon looking at that, very much of the awareness of the position of the sun in the sky, and the stars. So uh, the sense of astrology as we know it today was in, was very different for different cultures, including, you know, the, the way that the astrology we know the route that that came through, <clears throat> uh, through really Greeks and Romans, and it even goes before that. Um, so we're going to look at Mayan culture to start with, and they have a different cosmology, which is their origin of the world, different belief system, and their sense of what the um, astronom astronomy uh, worked out to be. So this is kind of a large piece. This is 16 inches um, over, a, a, you know, almost a foot and a half large piece made out of flint, very carefully uh, worked. You can kind of see those edges. We're used to looking at things like arrowheads that are made out of flint, and this is far more complex than that, as you can see. Uh, carefully notched out, very very sharp stone, um, just notched out really carefully to represent all these details here. So what we have is the first father, and he is tilting back, and we have some other figures here too, they're tilting back for the speed of this uh, crocodile canoe. They're sort of on a boat going through the sky, and they're going into the underworld. So that they're on these waves of the ocean, um, but I, I don't mean to say they were going through the sky, but you hold this up to the sky um, as an astro astronomical device, but we'll get into that in a minute. But we see a face here going downward here. There's another face down here. And we see the crocodile's jaws here. So the first father, um, we think about him, the, the beginning of the world, as precisely on August 13th, 3,114 3, uh, B.C. So that's when the first father was sacrificed after losing a ball game against the Lords of Death, so 605. And have you ever heard of the um, Mayan ball court, <clears throat> the game? It was extraordinarily difficult. It was kind of a combination of soccer and basketball, and they went through these tiny little hoops, played to the death. Literally, the loser <laughs> would be killed, and that's kind of um, when you think about when people say things like blood sport or... Um, you know, how aggressive football gets or that kind of thing. Those origins were to some degree in in the love of, of this sport um, played many years ago, many thousands of years ago, and even, even a couple hundred years ago. Um, but this is an ancient game, and our first father dies and passes on his lineage, um, but he's going to go to the underworld, called the place of creation and it's ruled by a water monster god so that makes sense that it would look like a crocodile right these are waves underneath here that's meant to look like waves and um, let's see what our other details we want to get into here so um, the the two of the lords appear on the top so these are lords here as well and they're leaning back to suggest the speed of the journey now this imitates to some degree, the look of the Milky Way galaxy in the sky. If you've ever seen it, and if you go up to some elevation, even like 4,000 feet, um, and there's no other lights, you can see the Milky Way quite clearly. Even in city lights, there are times when you can see it better than others. Um, I'm not an expert at that, so I wouldn't know exactly. But this particular piece will line up um, in on August 13th, um, every year and it will it will line up with certain objects here would line up with the brightest stars in the milky way now that not might not still be true um but this the sky actually changes over time and our place in it but i would imagine it's all it's been about 
you know, we're looking at 1500 years here, 1400 years, it's probably still true that the sky looks the same. This isn't as ancient as, as some things. So it's an important depiction of the Mayan story, the cosmology. It can be used as an astronomical observing device. And when you think about the Milky Way sort of dipping into the um, out of the sky, um, then it makes sense that this sort of boat or this sort of movement of this piece would dip out of the sky in a canoe-like way because there's a peak time to look to look through this and to see it and then past that point um, the Milky Way starts to disappear. So it's a lot of different um, things coming together here but it's telling the story of the cosmology. Uh, it's beautifully crafted and it's also um, something that can be used when held up to the sky. Next thing we're going to look at is the calendar stone, the sunstone. And I'm going to skip ahead this way first. So it weighs 24 tons. Tonatiu, the sun god, is in the center. And we have four squares. We're going to back up and look at that. And then 20, a ring with 20 animals. So our four squares are going to come off here in these different segments. And the belief system was that in, in, the, um, in the Mayan calendar, sorry, our... our um, Aztec calendar, I beg your pardon. The Mayan calendar, I, I don't know how similar the two are. But the, the Aztec calendar here is that the world has been destroyed and recreated multiple times in their cosmology here. So this is about a five, six hundred year old piece. Um, and um, this particular piece you know, was hidden off, it was beginning, it, in the beginning it was on top of a temple, then it was hidden away, probably to do with the conquistadors coming around this time, that timeline matches really well, and they hid that from them, perhaps they, they knew that it would be destroyed, but imagine moving something 24 tons somewhere um, off the top of a high pyramid and, and tucking it away somewhere, it's, it's hard to imagine. Uh, at any rate, so these four um, different, this is our um, main deity here, Ten, um, getting tongue-tied, I apologize, Tonatiu, and then we have our four different ways in which the earth has um, been destroyed, flood, and fire, and so on. And I don't know which symbol um, refers to what. So then the next layer around here are 20 different animals. Some are easier to see than others. That's kind of more snake-like right there. Uh, that kind of looks more dog or uh, fox-like. But we have different animals that go around and correspond to the different days of the month. So you might say, oh, there's, there's 30 or 31 days in the month. Well, in the, in the Aztec calendar, there's 20 days. And this would also tell us um, when... Um, there would be sacrifices uh, that, you know, we have human sacrifice in this culture. So this calendar is going to tell us the most auspicious day for these different things to happen. Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention about uh, this was that, I feel like I'm forgetting one more thing. So, oh yeah, that the earth is going to eventually be at the end in an earthquake. Now by that they probably mean their locality, their place in the world, you know, Mesoamerica, South America. So when you think about that happening, um, that's that even could be somewhat truthful in that they've seen earthquakes in the past destroy everything and they've made out of stone and things that are, you know, able to crumble. They've seen fire, they've seen famine, that kind of thing. So an earthquake is not out of the question to think that the world would end in that way. Okay. Oh yeah, and it was painted originally, it had bright colors. Oh, and here's our four different destructions, wind, fire, floods, and wild beasts. Next piece we're going to look at um, is Hotshot. Now this is a lithograph, but it's kind of taking lithography to um, a different level because it has some collaging going on, and it has... Um, some different things happening. So lithography is a printmaking technique, but Rauschenberg uses it in a really experimental and unusual way. This is from 1983, and this is the beginning of the space shuttle program. You can kind of see that space shuttle image there a little bit more clearly in the interior. Uh, the interior, perhaps, of the steering mechanism. And 
he was invited. It's it's interesting because Rauschenberg's originally from Texas, from um, Port Arthur, Texas, very small town, but not far from Houston. So it's entirely possible that he, he was friendly with some people from NASA. But he was invited by NASA to do a commission, um, NASA slash ART, and that's on page 606. And it was a program designed for artists to record the history of space exploration. So in this case, he puts puts this together from the um, space first space shuttle launch and the development of uh, shuttle mania, which happened at that time. Okay, so I'm going to read a, a quote from him. Hotshot was to share and express my belief in the spiritual and physical improvement of life and mind through space curiosity. So this doesn't have as much of a literal meaning. It's very loose. A lot of Rauschenberg pieces will have repetition, like the rocket, um, the the shuttle itself. We see it in sort of this format, although this is slightly different. You know, repeating throughout. Um, we see those kinds of things with Rauschenberg's work. But he was kind of doing something that's more like a collage. It's not a direct, um, doesn't have a direct meaning. It's a little bit looser or more what we would call abstract. Okay. Very large, six foot eight, very, you know, life size, like a person size piece. Then we're going to get into science and mathematics to create art. And we did already kind of look at um, a similar piece to this. Um, and these are Makarna, you know, these are these um, uh, sort of stalactite formations within a dome. So this is sort of a sort of a partial dome underneath a, a bigger dome. There are 5,000 of these little segments, if you can imagine. And if you remember that uh, back in spirituality in, in chapter 4.1, we looked at... Um, the opening the front door of a temple of a um, mosque, and it was similar to this, okay? This is a little bit older than that. This is from uh, the 13th century Middle Ages, and this is in Spain. And if you weren't aware, um, parts of Spain uh, to the south were taken over by the Moors, and the Moors were um, North African. They were Islamic. So we have Moorish architecture, which is really a lot of the, the Spanish architecture that we see both in Spain and in the U.S. and elsewhere. That architecture, a lot of that really came from Islamic architecture. Um, but going back to the mathematical precision of this, um, each of these was measured out, and you can see how there's kind of, we're looking at a cutaway. It doesn't give us a better image. It gives us a cutaway of this shape here, um, with eight points, one, two, one, two, three, four, eight points here, creating a geometric space, um, and then the archways, and there's all kinds of geometry going on, and all kinds of measuring device using math, uh, very sophisticated, to come up with these different shapes to give us a sort of an organic, almost looking piece out of a geometric mathematical equation, if that makes sense. Now, I was going to tell you, and this, you can see it a lot better. These are underneath here. There's, sometimes there's wasp or beehives, if you can see that brown area. Um, there's not really a great shot of any of it. But the bees and wasps love this kind of a space. And when I, I went to the Taj Mahal many years ago, um, and <laughs> you were kind of running and dodging because, um, you know, the bees took to this sort of organic form that was made out of um, stone and tile. And this was meant to look like stalactites coming down from a cave. It was meant to look like that. And I would have to say that the natural creatures agreed. A lot of history here at the Alhambra. I'm going to have you look that up if you wish. Um, the, you know, it's in Granada, Spain. It's a massive structure. There's all kinds of different beautiful rooms. You can see a little bit of the paint and detail here. Um, geometric patterned um, uh, motifs going on throughout this piece. Absolutely gorgeous. So our Makarnas that are looking uh, like honeycomb um, and oh yeah I think we covered everything here. 